Hello, early birds. Hopefully everyone can hear my sound all right. Uh, maybe a couple of you, if you wouldn't mind just confirming if my audio is working, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. See the Q&A coming through. Sound is good. Thank you very much, Nancy. Okay, awesome. So I am just going to get us queued up to go live and we will be kicking off in just about three minutes. If anyone does have any questions before we get started, feel free to post them in the Q&A um, and I will um, do my best to answer them before we kick off. Just bear with me here a second. Just get this stream queued up and then we will launch. just one more minute and then we will kick off here so thank you guys for uh joining me on your lunch hour today um hopefully this will be a helpful session for you guys uh as you know it's going to be about uh source deductions and of course facebook you're not giving me a go live button why won't you give me a go live button ah. Da, 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 da. Bear with me a second, guys. Here. Yeah. Joys of technology. It never wants to work when you're trying to go live, does it? Okay, let me try a different browser. Firefox, will you work for me? Um, I think they got about 30 seconds more to go before uh, we need to go live. And of course, Firefox decides to do an update. Lovely. Thank you, Firefox. One of you will hopefully work. Let's see. <laughs> well, we may not be able to go live today. I don't know if this is a Facebook issue uh, or if it's an Andrew issue. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there we are. Now it's going to let me go live. <laughs> Finally. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for your patience. Let me uh, get my screen up so you can all join in all the fun. And we are live on Facebook, um, as well as we've got a number of you joining us uh, for our 
Zoom session. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, we are CPA for IT. We're a chartered professional accounting firm specializing in independent contractors. We've been doing that since 1984. Um, we are an ISO 9001 registered firm, um, which means that we are independently audit audited and uh, verified that we have processes that are constantly improving. Um, and one of those processes is making sure that we educate our clients and help them understand um, everything they need to know to reduce stress and increase net worth. Um, so today's session is going to be talking about um, source deductions and uh, payroll remittances. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about what exactly are um, payroll source deductions and payroll remittances uh, for those of you who are not familiar with them. So as an employer, you are responsible for collecting and remitting CPP um, and EI and tax remittances for all of your employees. Um, and that is something that needs to be remitted um, depending upon your um, threshold um, on a regular basis. And we'll talk more about what those deadlines are, um, but uh, they are really quite important because the penalties for making source deductions uh, source deduction payments late are quite significant. Um, and we're going to be going through all of those details and trying to break down what source deductions and payroll remittances are all about to help you understand the impending deadline. And the reason that there is an impending deadline is because if you want to declare a salary for yourself or any other employees in your organization, we do have a hard stop deadline. The last day in the 2020 year that you can pay a salary would be December 31st. Uh, which would mean that you're going to have payroll remittances, depending upon your threshold, in early January. So if you haven't already done any remittances, if this is your first year, if you want to top up your salary, now is the time to be discussing that. So many of you have seen an email or a couple of emails that we've sent out reminding you of this important deadline. And we will go through that email as well as the form that we have uh, prepared to help you understand what information your accounting team will need from you in order to help you assist to help assist you with your year end tax planning. I do also remind want to remind everyone that this is intended to be an interactive session. Um, and please do make use of the features built into zoom. Um, or if you're watching live on Facebook, you can post it into or you can comment on the video and um, we do have a colleague of mine who will then come and uh, post those as Q and A's here. Um, so order of priorities, I will be looking at Q and A first, uh, then I will be looking at the chat. Uh, and of course, if any of you want to actually speak and ask a question, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Um, so I'll be looking periodically as we go and it looks like we already have our first Q and A issues. Uh, so I'm having some tech issues. I wonder if I, if we will have replaced uh, created exception question mark. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, I have no idea what that question is. Um, so you're going to have to um, repost that question. Um, if because uh, I'm not I'm not unfortunately understanding what the question would be there. Um, so with that, I'm going to sort of. Uh, continue on with understanding payroll remittances and source deductions. Um, so the big question that many of you are wondering is, do I actually need to make any remittances uh, for 2020? Um, and if so, how much do I need to remit and by when? So really the, the ultimate deciding factor for this is trying to figure out whether you have you already have income for the 2020 year. This could be income from SERB programs. It could be income from full-time employment prior to incorporating. It could be income that you've already declared inside of your corporation that you declared earlier on in the year. If you do already have income, the question is, do you want to, the next question becomes, do you want to top up that income um, and usually we're looking at different tax brackets to try and figure out where we want to optimize you. And this is something your account manager will work with you on. But generally speaking, if you're under $40,000 uh, a year and in other income, 
there is a high probability that you may want to top up. Now, there are some unusual circumstances this year around CERB. Um, if you are on CERB, there are some clawbacks that begin to happen above $31,000. Um, so if you have received CERB, um, that is really an exceptional circumstance. And I encourage you to book um, a short conversation with your account manager about your individual circumstances. Outside of those people who are on CERB, um, it really is going to be around um, where we want to optimize your tax strategy. So in order to figure that out, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions and we will get to those questions later today, but they're going to revolve around how much money is your corporation earning? How much money have you actually taken out of your corporation? Um, and how much income do you already have? And that will help us determine where we can tax optimize your individual situation. But if you already have income um, and that you've declared um, from a um, year end that's already happened throughout the year. Um, and it's, you know, over, I would say $90,000, the likelihood of us topping you up is extremely rare. So it's probably not that critical um, that you reach out and touch space with your account manager at this point. So, um, you know, again, when we're calculating your remittance amount, we're looking at how much money you've withdrawn um, since your last corporate year end. And this is a really important factor in deciding how much your source deductions and your payroll will be because one of the limiting factors that we have as your accountants is that for all intents and purposes, if you've taken money out of your corporation, it's going to need to become either a salary or a dividend. Um, and, you know, I'm going to leave the discussion about salary versus dividends for another day because uh, that could be a whole session in and of itself. Uh, generally speaking, for our clients, we do recommend while you're earning income that you go in the form, you, you remunerate yourself in the form of a salary. Um, the other questions that are really important to know and understand is, you know, have you already made large co contributions to RSPs or do you plan to make large contributions to your RSPs? These are important factors because one, um, we can reduce the source deduction payment uh, amount to account for that. Um, and two, we're going to need to know that to optimize your tax planning. Because if you have made a very large RSP contribution, we don't want that RSP contribution to take effect at the lowest tax rates. We want to make sure that you're optimized so that that RSP contribution is going to be take is going to take effect at a higher tax bracket. Um, if you happen to have a target net income, this is really important for us to know. You know, some of you might be going out to try and arrange financing for the purchase of a home, um, in which case, you know, you might have taken a small amount of money out of your corporation, but will want to target a higher net income uh, so that we can qualify for loans uh, and financing that you might need for other reasons. And, and if that's your situation, it really is important to let us know so that we can optimize for that. Because usually, as your accountants, our strategy is to minimize the amount of tax you'll pay, which is usually done by minimizing the amount of salary that we'll declare for you because the corporate tax rate, as many of you know, is significantly lower than the personal tax rate. So generally speaking, we're trying to keep that, those uh, personal salaries as low as we possibly can. And then lastly, we want to know if you have any family members that we can do any income sp splitting with. Uh, and I say income splitting, not income sprinkling. Uh, the liberals were nice enough to take away that option from us. Uh, once upon a time, we used to be able to give dividends to shareholders without having to have any reasonableness test, without having to have any um, requirement to work in the business. That strategy, unfortunately, has been taken away. Uh, so usually if we're doing income splitting, that's going to be done in the form of a salary, uh, which we can still do. However, a salary for family members is subject to a reasonableness test. Um, and it is really important, especially when we're talking about children, to see a flow of money, to put together a job description, and to have the documentation to be able to back up the justification for that income splitting. Um, now, understanding the different remitter types and the remitter due dates can get a little bit confusing. Um, and I'll go through the different remitter types um, in a second. And the remitter types do also ultimately affect your due dates. Now at CPA 4IT, what we do is we err on the, shot, err on the side of caution, which means we basically 
tell you to pay on the earliest date that it could be due, which is going to be the third day of the month following which your uh, payroll is paid. So if you're making a payroll uh, remittance or a deemed remittance on December 31st, then we're going to tell you that the deadline is January 3rd, which you'll see in all of our communication. Some of you may indeed have a remittance deadline that's later than that, uh, but we're going to work with that January 3rd deadline just to make sure that no one misses a deadline and that you've got maybe a couple of extra days if you are in a different threshold. Um, so they, the remittance uh, due dates are always based on when the employee is paid. Um, and this can get a little bit confusing uh, for owner managed businesses because you might be taking money out throughout the year. Typically money you take out throughout the year um, we consider it to be a director's advance, not a salary or a uh, payroll. Um, that is to take it out so that you can pay for expenses on behalf of the corporation, um, which would reduce your director's advances. Um, and at the end of the year, we look at what those director's advances are and do typically an annual um, tax planning and we make an annual remittance and we pay um, yourself, who's also the business owner, a payroll once a year. Um, and that's typically done December 31st. Now, it's not always done December 31st. You could have a payroll remittance anytime throughout the year, um, depending upon a number of different factors. So one of the most important factors is understanding that we can declare a bonus up to anytime throughout the, the year and up to 173 days from your fiscal year end. Um, so if you have a, a, a year end that's in the first six months of the year, um, you can bonus out six months, but it's gonna be in the same calendar year. If you have a year end that is July or later, you can bonus out uh, 173 days, which will actually put you into the next calendar year. So if you have a year end that's July or onwards, and we did a um, tax planning for the 2019 year that involved a bonus into the next um, calendar year, 173 days from your fiscal year, you may already have um, salary that's been declared for 2020 that was declared in your 2019 fiscal year end. So hopefully everyone's following along with me on that. And I do see that we've already got one question that's popped up. Um, and, and Elena is wondering, uh, wants to know if we could do this, uh, <laughs> if you could do a session on salary versus dividend. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think that that's something we could do and we can arrange. It might be a shorter session, maybe 15, 20 minutes, but I think that that does justify its own session. So Elena, I'll, I'll get you covered on that. Um, so uh, now that we understand that the deadline is going to be a function of when you pay your your um, employees and when you pay your employees, if it's an owner manager, is going to probably be a function of your year end. Uh, it's also important to note that if that uh, deadline does happen to fall on a weekend or a public holiday, you do get given a grace period to the next business day. That's pretty much standard across all tax remittances. Um, so if your GST, corporate tax, uh, payroll, if any of those deadlines happen to fall on a weekend or a holiday, you do get to the next uh, business day. Now, one of the things I also want to make sure that you're aware of is just be careful about um, making sure if you're making online payments, and we'll get into the different ways that you can pay, that you make your payment uh, 24 hours before the deadline because the banks will clear it the next business day, which is another important thing to know. Um, you know, if there, there are a couple of exceptions to these deadlines, uh, mostly around if your business goes bankrupt, um, you do have only seven days after the closure of the business to make a remittance on that. Um, but outside of that, it's going to be subject to your remitter threshold. And your remitter threshold is determined by something they call your average monthly withholding amount. Now, to make it even more confusing, it's not your average monthly withholding amount from the current year or even last year, it's from two calendar years ago. Um, so this can get really confusing. Now, what CRA does, and many of you have seen this over the last month, is they will send you out a notification to let you know if and when your threshold changes. 
And when you get that letter, all it's really telling you is that your deadline is changing. And to understand what your deadlines are, I've got this next fancy little slide uh, that explains the different thresholds that are available. So there is a regular remitter, a threshold one, a threshold two, a quarterly remitter, and then a remitting period for associated corporations. So starting on the left-hand side, uh, by default, everyone, when they first uh, create a payroll account is a regular remit remitter. In addition, if you have an average monthly withholding amount of less than $25,000, then you are a regular remitter. This is the longest uh, deadline that there is. So you'll get until the 15th of the following month. So if you pay your employee on December 31st, you would have until January 15th to make your remittance. If you are a threshold one, um, this means that you have average monthly with withholding amounts that exceed $25,000 and are under basically $100,000 then you're now due on the 10th day. And again, you will get notifications for this. In addition, you can log into your MyCRA account to determine what threshold you are. Uh, but when in doubt, err on the side of caution and use the threshold two deadline. Uh, now, very few of our clients actually fall under a threshold two, which is over $100,000. So if your average monthly withholding amounts are uh, $100,000, i.e. if your payroll remittance that you made two years ago uh, was more than $100,000, then you're due on the third. Um, there are two other types of remitters that don't generally speaking apply to uh, our client base. There's the quarterly remitter, um, which is if your average monthly withholding amount is less than $3,000, then you're eligible to remit quarterly instead of ostensibly monthly. So first of all, I want to make sure that you understand that CRA is anticipating that you have a normal payroll with employees who are being paid every single week. So if you were paying them every week, you would need to be making a monthly remittance for them. Now, as an owner manager, like most of our clients are, you don't have that monthly payroll. You're only paying yourself. And as I said earlier, you're typically doing that once a year as opposed to every single month. So, um, having the advantage of being a quarterly remitter is not really an advantage for you because you're actually only making one remittance once a year anyways. Uh, but in order to qualify for that, you would have to have average monthly withholding amounts of less than $3,000. Again, not, not very applicable in our client situation and, and not that relevant. So you're really looking at, am I a regular remitter? Am I a threshold one? Those are the two most likely um, deadlines. Um, and or possibly in, in the worst case scenario where I'm a threshold due and I'm due by the third of the month. Lastly, there are associated corporations. Um, so many of our clients will have holding companies, although typically they're only um, or usually doing payroll from one company. Sometimes it's two. Um, and basically it's uh, determined by your combined average monthly withholding amounts. So again, we are gonna tell all of our clients to focus on the January 3rd deadline, which gives you, buys you a bit of extra time in, in case you happen to run any problems with making those remittances. Um, so, um, you know, a new remitter or is by default, as I said earlier, a regular remitter. Now, if you are brand new to our firm, um, what you may or may not realize is that we do not set you up with a payroll account by default. Uh, that's because many of our clients have come from full-time employment before incorporating um, and they may have salary and not want to declare income in the first year. That's actually a very, very common situation. So for that reason, we don't set up a payroll account because we don't want you to be on CRI's radar and them sending you a bunch of notifications and trying to apply deadlines on you when you don't have any remittances to make. Um, so um, if this is your very first time um, remitting payroll, we will need to create a payroll account. Uh, that can be done with a phone call. It can also be done with an online payment. The only thing to note is if you have not created a payroll account, you will not be able to make a remittance at a physical bank. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the different payment methods that are, that are available to you. So again, um, by default, uh, you are going to be a uh, regular remitter um, and you do need to create a payroll account 
Um, that can be created automatically by making a payroll remittance um, or by calling CRA. Um, and the one thing that that um, is really valuable about creating a payroll account is they will send you a, a remittance form in the mail, um, which is what you will need if you're going to be making that payment in person at the bank, which I'm not a big advocate for, but if you're that type of person who likes to walk into your bank and build a personal relationship with your local branch, uh, you will need that form. So there are different remittance methods that are available for you. So my first choice is going to be um, online banking. Um, and um, for those of you who want it, we'll make a, a copy of this presentation available in, in a PowerPoint form where you'll, these links are clickable to find out more information about how you would make online banking payments. Uh, we also do send some information about how to do that. You can find that on our website as well. Um, but basically you log into your online banking account, you put in your payroll account number, you make a payroll remittance through their platform and Bob's your uncle. Uh, there is also an option to make a payment through the CRA, my payment account. The thing to be aware of this is this is effectively an online interact payment and will be limited by whatever your interact limits are. Um, now I do see another question has popped up in here. So I'm gonna try and go and answer that. And I just have the letter A. So Margaret, I'm gonna ask you to repost that or maybe that was done in there. Um, so the, the my, oh, there we go. Uh, at my bank, there is a limit to how large the payment is. So I usually have to split the payment and make the second payment during the second week. Yes, that is um, uh, not uncommon and, and definitely an issue with making a payment through the My Payment portal. Again, one of the advantages of us usually saying the third when you actually have till the 10th or, or maybe even the 15th is it does buy you that extra time. But you wanna do your past, uh, like you know, your payroll remittance is, is probably one of the larger taxes you're going to be paying. Um, so make sure you understand what your um, limitations are put on by your bank um, so that you can make those, uh, you have enough time to make those payments. And it looks like something's coming through in the chat here as well. Um, who is the payee if you're paying through on? So it, it's it's uh, it's a it's CRA, um, and and it's the CRA payroll remittance. Um, and so hopefully that's uh, okay for you, Joy, if you've got that. And uh, the other options that are are available to you is is now they do have pre-authorized debit, which is available. They also have paying by credit card, uh, Interact, but these are done through uh, various third-party providers. Uh, and they do typically charge a fee for that over and above you know, any of your um, processing fees that you will have through your bank or your credit card with that. Um, you can, of course, pay by check, um, which is a better option than paying in person at a bank. Although the, the only option, the only downfall to that is you got to make sure that you're getting enough time for that uh, check to make it to CRA to be processed in time. Um, paying in person, um, not a big fan of that, obviously, because the whole COVID thing um, and trying to avoid, you know, interactions where and when we can. Um, but it's also um, does require that you have a very specific form that we cannot produce for you. Uh, it's a form that's mailed to you from CRA. Um, you do need to uh, have it sent to you. And with CRA right now, we're not sure how long exactly that, that does take. The form is called the, the PD-7A. Um, uh, there's the PD-7ARB, a couple different variations of that, but you will be sent this form. It will have your corporate information on it. I'm not sure why you can't print this form, but you cannot. Um, now, I think one of the things you can do is uh, if it if your payroll account has been set up, uh, you can go and download it from your mail account, from your My Business account, uh, but it does still need to be sent to you or to your My Business account through CRA. Um, if, you, um, if, if you are making, um, I think we have a note here that if you receive a notice of assessment that states you owe, uh, that you have an amount owing, um, use only the remittance form attached to that notice to make the payment. That's not actually entirely true. If you're making, you can make online payments. Um, what does sometimes happen is, is payments get 
reallocated to the wrong account all the time. Um, this is um, this is quite common, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But I guess before we do that, I, I should let you know if you are not planning to make a remittance this year and you have in the past, it is important to let CRA know or they're going to basically send you a notification or worse yet, potentially issue an arbitrary assessment uh, based on previous year's information. So you can let CRA know either online through your My CRA account, uh, over the phone uh, or by mail. Um, that PD7A form is a good way to be able to notify CRA that you have no eligible employees with any eligible remittances during that period. Um, so you can just send in that form that says just that. And then they do ask you to put on that form when you expect to have uh, remittances again. If you're unsure, just put it for December 31st next year, and then you'll get notified again next year. And then you can again, send in another form. Um, I, I would encourage you to, to um, at least leave it for, for, for one year and not let the whole year go. Um, but if you're not making any remittances, I encourage you to fill in that form and or go on online and let them know. Now, as I said earlier, it's not uncommon for payments to be misapplied. Um, it's also not uncommon for people to not remit enough uh, or to sometimes over remit. Um, and so how do you how do you correct these errors? So a misapplied payment is is very easy to correct. It can be done again online through the my business account. Um, it can also be done with a phone call. Um, so the most common mistake when you're making a payroll remittance is that they're going to ask you for a couple of key pieces of information. They're going to ask you for the number of employees, for the gross payroll amount, um, and for the remitting period. So the number of employees and the gross payroll amount, most people aren't going to have a problem with that. Um, usually what's going to mess people up is their uh, remitting period. So they might put their year end date, um, which would then, you know, if, it, if their year end was, let's say, July um, or some other month other than December, and you're making a remittance in January, now, boom, instantly you're hit with a late penalty of 10%. Uh, potentially more, and we'll talk about those in a second, um, because they've applied it to the previous period as opposed to the current period. So as I said, that can be fixed with a phone call very easily. Now, if you have under remitted, um, and one in common example is maybe you decide to up the uh, amount that you want, but it's after uh, the amount of salary that you want, but it's after your year end date, that's quite a common occurrence. Um, so as long as you have remitted and covered the CPP, an employer is allowed or an employee is allowed to ask the employer to reduce the tax withholdings. Um, the employer must um, withhold the CPP, 100% of the CPP, um, even if uh, the, uh, the only exception to that is if the, um, if the uh, employee uh, is um, not required to remit CPP, i.e. under 18, uh, or have opted out of CPP uh, because they are uh, over the uh, maximum age and have uh, remitted the appropriate forms. So if not, you must remit the CPP. Um, now, uh, most of our, and EI, if it's applicable, most of our clients aren't uh, using EI because um, EI, well, uh, employers can now opt into um, doing EI for arms length employees. It typically is not worth it. You have to pay more into it than you can receive back. Um, but the employee is allowed to tell the employer to not withhold the tax. Um, so if the employee employer has not withheld enough tax, um, what we do is we issue a T4 in February that says, this is how much tax that we've withheld on this salary. This is how much CPP we've withheld, which will match the amount that you have remitted to the government for your remittance. Um, now, when the employee goes to file their tax return, the amount of tax withheld won't be sufficient to cover the taxes that they owe on that salary. And in that situation, they will owe an additional amount uh, when they file their tax return in April. And of course, the, the opposite happens if you make an over contribution. Um, with financial plannings in mind, 
when is the best time to set up a corporation's fiscal year end when you're registering a corporation and why. So uh, typically um, choosing a year end date, you have one year and one week from the date of incorporation to choose as your fiscal year end. So typically um, you wanna go as, as long as you possibly can so that you don't have a short stub year end, which could cost you as much in accounting fees to prepare as a full year end. Um, unfortunately, a lot of clients uh, hope that if they, you know, it's six months or eight months, and it's not going to be the same cost as a full year. But unfortunately, the reality is, you know, a lot of the same work goes into preparing a short stub year as goes into preparing a full year end. Yes, a little bit less, but not a, um, it's not proportionate. The, the amount of work does not decrease proportionately to the number of months that you have. So you typically want to go as long as you can. Um, however, there are advantages, as I mentioned earlier, to having a fiscal year end in the second six months of the year, so July and onwards. And that advantage is the ability to bonus into the next calendar year. Uh, because you get that 173 days to declare income from your year end, uh, a July or onwards um, year end gives you the ability to effectively straddle three year ends three calendar years within a uh, fiscal year of the corporation. Because you could pay on the first day of your year end, which would be July 31st. Uh, let's, let's, let's say we're using a July 31st uh, or July 31st, 2020 year end as an example. So you could pay on August uh, 1st of 2019, which would be in the 2019 year. Um, you could pay on uh, July 31st of 2020, which would be in the 2020 year end, or you could declare a bonus out into um, late uh, January, which is 173 days uh, from the fiscal year end, um, which would put it into the 2021 calendar year. Whereas if you had a June year end, yes, you would still get the option of declaring salary on July 1st, the first day of the fiscal year end 2019, um, or you know, 173 days from June, which would still be in late December, which would be 2020. So it gives you two calendar years, but not three. So a uh, fiscal year end that falls in the second six months of the year does have some additional advantages. Uh, I have that my year end is February. Uh, confusing it is recommended to change it to, is it recommended to change it to match the yearly calendar? I, I probably wouldn't. Um, you can make requests to change your fiscal year end. Um, it, uh, you have to have a reason for why you're changing it. Um, I, like I said, is if people who with a February end, you know, here are some advantages of having a February end is um, you're going to, your, your deadlines are probably going to be, um, you have a three month deadline, um, which is going to be at the end of May, you know, accountants are a little bit less busy there. Uh, and then you have a six month deadline for corporate tax, which is in the middle of the summer, which is really light. So the advantage you've got is um, you're going to get lots of attention, Tim, because and hopefully speedy turnaround times because you're coming in at a lower at an earlier time. Now, do you miss out on that third year um, tax planning maneuver? Yes. Uh, now, typically that that maneuver is only used by people who are behind the eight ball. Um, and you're trying to do a catch up and you're deferring, 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 um, which can be a bit of a snowball effect in its, in its own right. Um, but generally speaking, I probably would not change my year end um, unless there was a really, really good reason to do so. And adding an additional tax planning strategy is probably a, not a good enough reason to do so. Okay, so hopefully I've covered what to do if you've under remitted or over remitted or have a misapplied payment. If again, you're having any troubles, you're not sure what to do, that's what our team's here to do. We can make those calls for you. It's quite easy for us to fix that. Um, now, one of the big things to be aware of is that the penalties on a late source deduction payment are very, very significant. It's 10% the minute you are late. So if you do it at uh, 12.01 a.m., is it a.m. or p.m.? Whatever it is, in the, in the, it, you know, it, when it when it in the evening, um, if you make it um, if you make it at twelve oh one, you're now late um, and you are going to be hit with a ten percent penalty. Um, 
you know, if you're going to be late before you make your remittance, come talk to your account managers. Uh, we do usually, accountants usually have a loophole or two up their sleeve. Um, so we'll see what we can do for you. Um, but the penalties are, as I said, 10% right away. And in fact, if you've been late more than once, uh, they can apply a 20% penalty um, on any second uh, late payment or future or second or beyond. Um, so you really, really don't want to miss this penalty or miss this deadline. Um, and this is why we send so many notifications around this. We do so many webinars around this. It really, really is an important deadline. Um, and that's because from CRA's perspective, this isn't the employer's money. Um, this is uh, the employee's money that the employer has withheld. Um, and so not remitting it is tantamount to stealing from the employee or uh, fraud. Uh, so CRA come down very, very hard on this deadline. Um, so you do not want to miss it. Um, and again, we give everyone plenty of notice. We're telling everyone it's the January 3rd deadline when most of you probably fall on the January 10th deadline. There really is no excuse for missing this. Um, and we have plenty of time right now. If you're not sure what to do, reach out and speak to your account manager. Um, so I hope I've covered most of the questions um, that, that you might have. I do want to go through some specific stuff to our process and talk through some of the emails uh, that you're getting from our team. So first, uh, I want to share with you the most recent email that you would have got from um, us. Um, and this will probably be the last notification that you will get until the January 3rd deadline. Um, so if um, you are doing your own tax planning and you don't need our help, please click this so you don't get any more reminders. There will be two more reminders that are coming out of this. Um, they, they will be in a few weeks um, on January 3rd um, and then another one after that on January 10th, um, just for those uh, people who really missed the deadline. But if you've got this settled, click this button. Um, if you feel like you've already done the work with your account manager um, and for some reason you're still getting these notifications, again, you can click this middle reminder it will stop those notifications. Um, now, if you are not using our online form and you are using one of our old school um, Excel spreadsheets and you've sent that into your account manager, if you could just do us a favor and click this button, uh, that will stop the reminders as well. Um, we do love technology and automation. We are using a lot of automation to make sure we get those reminders out here. And we don't want to inundate you with unnecessary communication. Um, so if you just, uh, take a second and just tell us what the status is of uh, how you're working on your source deductions. It really helps us out. Um, and then lastly, um, if you complete this worksheet, that will also stop the reminders. Now, I've got a couple other questions that have popped up here. Um, so I have been submitting NIL payroll remittances monthly in 2020. Am I correct? Continue to submit NIL for November and then remit the source deduction. Um, for director owner salary on December remittances. Um, do, can we internally assign the salary uh, in a ROE, um, for example, to whatever pay periods we want between January, uh, October 31st, 2020, even though uh, nil remittances were submitted for these months? Um, not really. Um, so um, uh, do we have to reopen WSIB account uh, for uh, director or family salaries? Uh, most of our clients are exempt from WSIB because of the nature of their work. Uh, there are some changes coming down the line on that. Um, so normally you do not need to open a WSIB because most uh, knowledge-based workers are exempt. If you are not in the knowledge space, space um, and you are and your work does is applicable for WSIB um, yes you should be opening a WSIB account um, I have been and then getting back to the first question um, so if you're just going to make your first remittance in December then yes do a nil return there now as far as applying salary to different periods and I'm assuming that this is going to be related to wage subsidy um, so the Technical answer is no. Um, we have 
for many of our clients who are um, applying for wage subsidy, um, they are assuming that the payroll remittance that is an annual pay is going to be applied over the course of the year. It's, it's an aggressive interpretation, but it's the only way to be eligible for the period if you have not been doing remittances. Um, and as many of you know from all those sessions we did earlier, if you're doing wage subsidy or even contemplating it, we have been encouraging more and more people to move to monthly remittances uh, earlier on in the year. Um, we've got one more question here from Facebook, which says, I took a dividend last year, so didn't pay any source deductions. If I decided to change last year's salary, I guess I would have to remiss uh, source deductions late and pay a 10% penalty. Um, and effectively, yes, there are some tricks up our sleeve. So Rob, um, uh, speak to your account manager and they can tell you what the tricks up our sleeve are. Um, but there will be a 10% penalty uh, no matter what. There are some ways for us to minimize that to make it as, as less painful as possible. Um, sorry about the bad grammar there. Um, so as you said, any withdrawals during the year can be treated as an advance, um, is the interest needs to be provided for the advance or it can be interest-free advance, which is cleared at the year end against business expense. So we do have to, uh, declare interest. We calculate that for you. Um, so that's one of the things that you'll, many of you may have noticed. There is a calculation for interest on director's advance that is calculated, uh, at your year end by your accounting team. Uh, what about uh, serve dates not conflicting with dates of services rendered uh, for the salary paid? So for serve, um, the again CRA is most likely going to interpret um, the payroll remittance date as the payment date, um, and so you're not able to say I made a remittance in December, but it was actually for or in January for a December one, but it was actually for you know January. Um, you can't really do that. You, you would have to make a, a late remittance in February, you know, that was due in February. It's now a late remittance. Um, so, you know, if you're making a payment in January of this year, it would be for the December period. If it's not for the December period, payroll period, it is late and will apply uh, and penalties will, will apply. So hopefully that answers those questions. Um, if any more pop up, I will do my best to answer that. But I did also want to show you guys um, one other document, uh, which I have, I had, no, nope, not that. Okay, I was gonna show you the tax planning worksheet. Hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, clicking on the link live will work. Yes, thankfully it did. Um, okay, so this is the form that we're um, asking uh, our clients to complete. Um, it um, might look overwhelming. If you're not sure, just complete as much of it as you can. Um, so the first and most important question is, do you want us to prepare your T4s for you and or T5s? Um, you know, that will just trigger us to make sure that we're preparing that for you. If you tell us no, um, we won't prepare it for you. Um, or if you tell us it's you're going to prepare it, we will not be preparing it for you. Um, so the first, one of the first questions we want to know is how much money did your business earn? This is important for us to know because um, it helps us to figure out that optimum tax planning strategy. You know, if, if you made a million dollars in your business this year, net income, paying yourself a $10,000 salary, probably not a good tax planning strategy. Uh, I did not understand the reply. Can you repeat it again to me? Um, so I believe your question, um, can you repeat the question, uh, if you don't mind it, cause I don't remember which one was yours actually, although I can go in here and see, so bear with me a second. It was, uh, withdrawals during the year can be treated as an advance is, does the interest needs to be provided to, for the advance or it can be an interest-free advance. So it cannot be an interest-free advance directors advance do bear interest. That interest has to be calculated at an amount that is prescribed by CRA. As I said earlier, uh, for our clients, we will calculate that interest for you. Um, so hopefully that you got it that time. Um, 
So don't collect request CRB for the payday in December. Yes, exactly, Nancy. You can't do CERB in December if you're making a payroll remittance in January for the December period. Uh, then, okay, um, so going through the rest of this. Uh, how much money did you spend on business related expenses that you paid for personally? So this is again important for us to know because it helps us to understand um, where your director's advances are gonna be because anything that you've paid for with your own funds will reduce the amount of director's advances that you have. Um, and then the next question is how much did you pay for with business related? And the reason we have this in here is to, to just make sure you understand the difference between expenses you've paid for um, through the business with a business credit card or business um, debit card uh, or check and how much you paid for with your own funds. So funds paid through the corporation will not reduce the director's advances. Funds paid for personally will reduce the director's advances. And then the next question we wanna know is, well, how much money did you actually withdraw from your business, which is your director's advances? Keep in mind that any source deduction remittances that you made, those count as, as director's advances as well, because when we declare your salary, um, you know, if you were paid $100,000 as an employee at a company, they would not actually give you $100,000. They would give you $100,000 less the payroll remittance. So when you make your, when you take out and make your payroll remittance, that's the director's advance as well. Um, and we've got a typo here. How much money has your company already paid towards 2020, not um, 2209 uh, payroll remittances? Um, so we just want to know, you know, have you already made any remittances? I uh, will double check this when we prepare your T4s, but it just, again, helps us with the planning. Um, did you take any money out of your uh, corporation for the purchase of a home or a car? Um, you know, we're doing an advanced tax strategy next week um, seminar to talk about home loans and auto loans and what those are. Uh, these are a strategy that we can uh, do to minimize the amount of director's advances that you will have to declare as salary. So if you've taken it out a bunch of money, but it was for a home or auto loan, um, please include that, but include that on a separate line from how much money you've taken out. Um, and then um, we've got your, just confirming your personal details um, and including your RSP contribution limit, if you know it. If you don't know the answer to these questions, you don't have to fill them in. They are not required. Um, you know, uh, we will let you know what fields are required when you go to submit it if you haven't completed them. Many of these are not required. Um, and many of these will also come in pre-populated as well. If we have the information in our systems from previous years, we will pre-populate that. But knowing your RSP contribution limit is helpful for us. Uh, knowing if you have any other personal income from outside the corporation is very important to us. Uh, knowing if you have any other deductions that are gonna re reduce your taxable income also helps us uh, with the tax planning. Um, and then of course, we want similar information for your spouse. Um, again, this is just, arming your account manager, the more information that you can complete in here, the more information that your account manager is gonna to have to be able to optimize your tax planning. Um, and then uh, we're down to family details as well. Um, and your sole proprietorship, if you if you are coming, converting from a sole proprietorship, um, this is helpful for information for us to have. Looks like we've got one more question that has popped up here. Um, Another Facebook question. If my year end is January 30th, 2020, um, when should the T5 be prepared for last year's dividend? So T5s and T4s are all due at the same time, which is uh, the end of February. Um, so if it's for a 2021 um, dividend, then that would have to be prepared by February of 2022. If it's for a dividend that's paid during the 2020 calendar year, because again, a dividend could be paid anytime during your calendar year, which would mean it could be paid February 1st, 2020, or it could be paid January 30th, 2021. So if it's a February 1st, 2020 dividend, then you prepare your dividend by uh, the end of February, 2021. If it's a January 30th dividend, then you would prepare your T5 by February of 2022. Hopefully that answers your questions uh, there. Um, so I think I, I've been through a lot. Um, I know that source deductions can be overwhelming um, and confusing, particularly if you're new to it. 
even clients who have been with us years still find it a little bit um, perplexing. If you um, felt like your questions were not answered today, I encourage you to take some time with your account manager, book a 15 minute review meeting with them. Um, again, if you can complete this form before that review meeting, it will arm them with more information to be prepared to be able to make that time as efficient as possible. If you just find this all overwhelming, just uh, again, go back to that email and say, I, I've done my tax planning with my account manager and then book a meeting with your account manager um, to go through that using their Calendly link. Um, so I'll leave it open for just a, another few minutes here uh, in case anyone does have any questions. We've wrapped a little bit early, uh, but if no more questions do come up, I'll give you guys an extra 10 minutes back towards your lunch. Um, and it does look, we've got another one coming in here. What steps need to be taken if you go from contract worker to full-time employee uh, for a year? Um, so really you, you need to sit down and hi, Natalia, it's good to see you again. Um, so sit down with your account manager um, because the um, big question is, have you taken any money out of your corporation? And will this now be, uh, will we need to take this on top of um, full-time salary? Are there some options to defer it? You know, account managers or accountants always have a loophole up their sleeve, as I said. Um, there is a strategy called carrying a net debit balance. It's effectively like taking a loan. Uh, you can do it for one year, but it needs to be repaid by the subsequent year. So there might be a strategy where you can, uh, even though you've taken money out of your corporation this year, maybe we don't declare a salary because it would be on top of full-time salary, which would probably not be very tax effective. Um, so maybe we look at deferring that and maybe repaying the money back into the corporation um, with funds you're earning from your full-time employment. But that is really, it's, it's you know, you've got to look at the numbers. You've got to um, understand your personal situation. So reach out to your AM. Um, and if you've got uh, your books uh, prepared, at least in a draft form, so we can understand how much money you've taken out of your corporation, as well as how much you have, um, how much you might have in expenses that you paid for. So even if you're a full-time employee, you're probably still going to have a home office. You might still have telephone and internet. You know, you're probably not going to have the same, near the same level of deductible expenses you had as a full-time employee. But if you're still looking for contract opportunities to return to, there's lots of expenses you may continue to have. So uh, if this is my first year as an incorporated business, uh, should I speak to an accountant to complete a tax planning? Uh, can I do this myself? So I would say, I, I, I encourage you to reach out and connect with your account manager if this is your first year, um, because there's a lot of things that can be a little bit more complicated in your first year. Like if you're coming from full-time employment um, how much money do you have? You know, optimizing that tax strategy in your first year, it really is worthwhile to just spend at least 15 minutes with your account manager to go through that. So I do encourage you to book some time with your AM. Um, so uh, if my director's advances is 80K and my personally paid expenses are 20K, then it means uh, I can withdraw 100K cash from my business account before the end of the year. Uh, so you got that a little bit backwards, Margaret. Um, so if your director's advances are 80K, um, I mean, I assume that means you with you have already withdrawn $80,000. Usually that, okay. So let's talk about debit balance versus credit balance. Okay, so a balance could be positive or negative. Um, so a debit balance uh, would mean that you've taken out 80K. Uh, a credit balance would mean you've lent the company eighty thousand dollars. So if you um, if you had lent the company eighty thousand dollars, and over and above that you had um, twenty thousand in expenses over the money you had lent to the corporation, in that situation you would be correct that you have a hundred k that you could take out before year end without needing to declare anything in salary. Um, now let's take the the flip side of that. Let's say that you had withdrawn um, eighty thousand dollars throughout the year and you had a debit balance in your director's advance of $80,000, but you had paid for $20,000 worth of expenses with your own money or with the $80,000 that, that you had withdrawn. 
then that means that we would have $60,000, 80,000 minus 20, as the minimum amount that we would need to declare as salary to cover that director's advance. Um, okay, we got another question here. Uh, I have a corporation, uh, but if I'm now on full-time payroll, do I need to close the corporation and continue the corporation without operation? Uh, can I still claim home office expenses uh, without income? Um, so uh, really got to talk to your account manager about your specific situation. Um, but, uh, you know, there are lots of reasons that you would keep a corporation open. If you have retained earnings, um, you would probably not want to close down that corporation. It may not be tax effective to do that. Uh, in which case the corporation would continue as a, effectively a holding company, uh, not an operating company, but a holding company. It would still have expenses. Uh, a home office is likely one of them, uh, but it really depends on your, your individual situation. So I'd say reach out and speak with your account manager and make sure you get some specific advice on your specific situation. Um, okay, well, hopefully we went through 22 questions today. Uh, 23, we got one more coming up. Uh, so going back to that example of 80,000 debit balance uh, and expenses for $20,000, um, I can I pay a $60,000 dividend? And if so, how are taxes calculated? Would it be the same as completing this as a T4? Um, so uh, maybe I'm gonna give you a short version of, of the dividend versus salary webinar right now. Um, so yes, a $60,000 dividend would cover that uh, effectively $60,000 debit balance uh, and would work from a tax planning perspective. Uh, how much taxes would you pay on that? Uh, you can go to taxtips.ca has a basic um, tax calculator, which is great. You can put in your um, uh, dividend amount or payroll amount to do an estimate, a rough estimate of what your taxes would be. Um, taxes on dividends are calculated very differently than taxes on salary. Uh, a dividend um, is not a deductible expense to the corporation. Um, that basically means that you are paying those dividends with funds that have been taxed already at the corporate tax rate. And because of that, you will get a dividend tax credit on the personal side, which is intended to offset the taxes that you have paid inside of the corporation. So there's something called the theory of integration. Theory of integration is, is intended to make the taxes the same for salaries and dividends when you take into account all the taxes. And by that, I mean, on a dividend, you're paying, as I said, corporate taxes and personal taxes. On a salary, um, because a salary is an expense to the corporation, it reduces the taxable income, which means effectively that salary has been paid with pre-tax money. Um, the employee pays tax at the full personal tax rate. So there's no tax credits there. Um, so when you take in those two situations into account, the, there should be no net tax difference or, or no significant net tax difference. And we've had clients go through this in the past and do, you know, calculate this up the wazoo. And I think across, you know, all the different options across all the different provinces, there's no more than a few dollars difference in the total tax when you, when you do take everything into account. Um, but uh, there is a difference from a perspective of RRSP room, a dividend is not eligible for RRSP room. There's a difference from CPP. Uh, again, dividends not eligible for CPP. Some people think that's a positive. Some people think that's a negative. We personally think CPP is a positive. It's a forced savings and it's a guaranteed um, income in retirement, uh, which we think is a good thing. So hopefully that answers that. Uh, we've got, it looks like some more questions coming in through the chat. Um, Ross is asking if uh, we can chat for five. Uh, unfortunately, I probably, I personally can't chat after this call for five to 10 minutes. Um, Ross, I've, I've got another meeting to run to, um, but you can book through my Calendly link. Um, uh, so any of my clients, you can book through my Calendly link, you, which you'll have available. Um, and it's uh, Andrew Wall, um, it's Calendly slash Andrew Wall CPA. Just keep in mind that uh, my time is billable. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, and uh, you can also go through your account managers uh, who will also be able to assist you uh, and myself. Um, who is, we got another question here. Uh, can you please advise who is the payee 
if we're so I think I yeah I, I believe I answered that one already earlier on. Okay, um, so with that, I think we are a wrap. So thank you everyone um, for your time today. Um, and uh, Ross, uh, please feel free to book a time in my calendar and uh, we'll connect as soon as possible. I'm sorry I can't accommodate you right after this meeting. Um, bye for now. Oh, one more, one more. What about if you take CCPC into consideration. Canadian controlled private corporation. I don't know what, what you mean. So I, I mean, I, I guess you're talking about dividends versus um, salary. Uh, so yes, still the same thing. Differences with the CCPC, Canadian controlled private corporation, um, and you're eligible for uh, the small business deduction limit. Uh, then it's what we call non-eligible dividends. So you get a dividend tax credit that's a different rate than um uh a um not than a, than a cc the regular ccpc which wouldn't be eligible for the small business rate i assume that's what you're talking about um but yeah it still still works the same no net difference um hopefully uh hopefully i got everyone's questions if not um you know feel free to post them in our facebook group uh, as everyone may recall, it's uh, facebook.com slash the self-employed support network. I uh, hope to see you guys there in the community and have a great day. Bye for now, everybody.